Karen Chapella, and on behalf of both Local and Solarize Bolton, I'd like to want to welcome you here tonight. Uh, this is a big season for Bolton Local. Um, first of all, we are two small steps away from applying to become a Massachusetts green community. The Sunday Globe featured the Repair Cafe on the front page of the Globe West. Ray Pau is here someplace. Congratulations to Ray for that. And tonight, the Solarize Bolton Committee introduces our chosen number one installer, Solar Flare. So we're really excited about it. This is Bolton Local gone large, and we're really pleased to be able to do this. We started last fall. Bolton Local voted to authorize me to see if there was any interest in going solar in Bolton. And the first email went out on the Bolton Local Yahoo group in October, and six unbelievably talented people actually volunteered to work on this. There were lots of other people who said, we already have solar and we'd be glad to testify, uh, but we don't want to volunteer. But the volunteers did that. Oh, did they know what they were getting into? But it has really been wonderful. Every one of those folks is really committed to energy conservation on behalf of our planet and our children. And we came up with a mission statement of saying that we wanted the best value at the best price of, for solar photovoltaic for most people, most residents and businesses in Bolton that we could manage. And it was in that basis that we wound up choosing the installer that we have with us tonight. We already had two people on the committee who already had solar installations. They're up on the stage today, and you're going to hear from them. And a third person with solar experience. So this was an unusually talented, uh, widely talented, and specifically talented committee that happened to just gather on the basis of a couple of emails this past fall. By the end of January, we had submitted a proposal to the Clean Energy Center. Um, we rallied the town behind us in order to do that. We became designated a Massachusetts solar community and by May 9th had chosen the best installer out of seven who had submitted proposals to us. Let me introduce the team and I'd like them to stand up as I mention them. Their pictures are there, so you'll recognize them. Melissa Albashan. <laughs> Margaret Campbell, who I think may be outside, you may have seen her out there. Tony Chikadik, who is our solar coach. <laughs> Jane Moosebroker from Bolton Local. <laughs> Christiana, who's our webmaster. Uh, and Chris Little, who is on the committee but is presenting a paper in Colorado this week and could be with us. He wishes us all well. And through all of this, with the great help and patience at our, at our impatience, was Elizabeth Youngblood from the Clean Energy Center. She is the senior project manager of the Commonwealth Solar Programs of the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. That itself, an impressive title. But just this Thursday, two days from now, is going to receive her Master of Science in Environmental Management from the Harvard Extension School. And her mother, all the way in from Minneapolis, is here. I'd like to actually ask her to stand up if she wouldn't mind, because we are so grateful that you raised such a bright, caring, industrious <coughs> daughter uh, who has given us so much help. So, Mrs. Youngblood, thank you so much. <laughs> and now, here is Tony. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, this is a quote here, I, I think it's from Scientific American, but I think it captures the situation very nicely. So that the sun not only sustains life on our planet, but it, there's ample power there to fulfill all of our energy needs many times over. And there's no, no carbon dioxide, there, there's no 
it won't run out and it's free. And with an investment in solar PV, you can capture this. You can get uh, reduce or eliminate your electric bill. This is, this is one of our, our many zero dollar electric bills over the years. It turns out that a small fraction of the U.S. land could power the, the, whole, uh, the whole country. It would take an area about the size of Massachusetts if it were located in Nevada, uh, and that would be enough power for the entire U United States. However, it would all be in the wrong place. So we feel that it's better, uh, superior solution to distribute the solar collectors and the storage uh, among the use points to avoid all of the losses that you encounter and the sun shines everywhere, so it's kind of a, a built-in energy distribution system that we've been given. And with that, we can minimize ugly, lossy transmission lines and, and leaky pipelines. So why, why solarize? I, uh, I'm originally from Ohio, and I came here to go to school at MIT in the late 60s and kind of fell in love with Boston and this part of the country. So in, in 72, I came back here and began a career at, at Raytheon as an engineer, working in Wayland, and I developed an interest in solar there. There was some work going on at Raytheon at the time in our advanced development lab. They were look, working on, uh, together with Arthur D. Little, microwave power transmission for space. The idea was that you would have solar panels on satellites and beam the power back down to Earth. For various reasons, that didn't uh, actually get implemented, but other countries like Japan are still looking at it, so it's very efficient. At that time, I, I got interested, and in uh, we bought land here in Bolton and, and built a house, and we did everything we could to make it energy efficient. Uh, solar PV at the time, though, would have cost a million dollars, so it really wasn't, wasn't practical yet. In the 80s, we, we put in solar hot water. There were many state incentives uh, at the time, and, and federal. And that served us well for a couple of decades. And then in 2013, we installed solar PV, which now was not only affordable, but it turns out to be a great investment. So my objectives and the objectives of our whole team here is to increase the education and awareness of solar PV and, and also conservation. That, that's a very big part of, uh, of uh, our message. And we want to also reduce greenhouse gas emissions, save trees. We want to help others to achieve major savings as we have. And we want to no longer be number one. What I mean by that is National Grid sends out these compare against your neighbors scorecards every, every couple months. And it isn't really fair. I mean, we, we come out number one, but none of our neighbors have solar yet. But we hope to change that so that others will have a chance uh, to come in first. Now, to do this, it takes a, it takes a team, as, as Sharon, Sharon said. We have a very dedicated and, and talented team. Here we are standing in front of a, uh, a ground mount array that happened to be on the solar tour that we held. Many of you uh, participate in the solar tour. Uh, so, this is our team, and I want to thank, again, as Sharon did, all, all, all the members of our team here who have done such hard, uh, excellent work. Thank you again. A little bit about our system. In 2012, right after I retired from Raytheon uh, for the first time, uh, we decided that solar was going to be our post-retirement project. So I use Google Earth a lot, and, and finally, they, when they updated the imagery, everybody could now see our solar panels from space along, along with our dog, uh, <laughs> who since passed away, rest in peace. Uh, on our roof, we had three rows of 11 solar panels, Bosch 255-watt uh, panels, and 8,400-watts 80, 80, peak. And our system used what we call a microinverter. I'll say a little more about that later. And there's one of those microinverters underneath each panel. They gave us a bi-directional net meter. This is a digital meter and that can be read remotely by National Grid. And when the photovoltaic is overproducing, it counts down. And initially, when we started up the system, it went negative. And then, as you see, 
it went positive for a while until we did some conservation, and then it came down and it's been below negative for the last year now. Down the basement, uh, these yellow wires here bring the power down from the three rows of panels into a breaker panel. There's one breaker for each row. And then, oops, we have a, a solar production meter that keeps track of how much energy the, the panels produce over its lifetime. This is very important because we call in the value from this every month to CEC so that we can get our, our solar, our SREC credits. We also have a, a system that allows us to monitor each individual panel that, that allows us to look on the internet. So system performance, uh, I've plotted here, this is the cumulative energy that we've produced. Just read, these are just readings of the production meter that you saw in the last chart, and it always increases. You can see that during the winter, the slope gets a little shallower because there's less sun to collect during the winter. Every, every winter that happens invariably. But it keeps going up, and we've, we're up to 33 and a half megawatt hours now. The other meter that you saw in the previous chart is the, the net meter. And as I mentioned, it, it went a little bit negative initially, but then the summer loads kicked in, air conditioning, pool, irrigation, and uh, it, it went up again. And then we started to institute energy conservation measures, and that started to bring it back down, and it gradually came down, and it's been below zero for the past, past year. So over three years, we've generated all of our electrical power, uh, and that's equivalent to 11 million AA batteries. And uh, the end phase gives us these interesting facts. And 1,500 laps of the Monaco GP, which the Formula One race is coming up there this, this weekend, so that's very interesting. In terms of environmental benefits, we offset 23 tons of carbon, which is equivalent to the work of 612 trees. And we had to cut down a few trees initially to get a high solar access of 95%, but it took only nine days of running the system to offset the loss of those trees. Financially, our investment is gonna break even uh, within, within the next year, before four years have gone by. And these are notable national grid bills. They're, we started getting the zero bills, and we've had 27 in, in a row now. So a little bit of Solar 101 that I wanted to put in the front here. How, how do these cells work? First, they were invented in 1954 at Bell Labs, and they used the PN junction. It was only 6% efficient. Today's panels are up to around 17% now. And here's a, a diagram showing how, how they work. There's a PN junction, and the sunlight breaks free electrons and allows them to flow through the material, and they come together at the junction here and, and create a current. If you're more into word diagrams, here's something from Scientific American that basically says how it works. The main point is that they use light, not heat. So you have photons in, electrons out. And each of those cells generates about half a volt of direct current like you get from batteries. So in most applications need more than just half a volt, so you have to put these in series. For example, a 12 volt car battery has six two volt acid cells connected in series. So in a panel, this is a 60 cell panel, this happens to be the one used on our house made by Bosch. These, these cells, each one of which is a crystal, actually a monolithic crystal, they're connected in series, down one column and up the next, and down one and, and up the next. So in the end, you have 60 of these all connected, and you get 30 volts. This is a typical panel from 2012. That one, this one has 15% efficiency. They're, they seem to be getting better by about a half percent per year. So today's panels, are, even the base panels offered by Solar Flare, are almost a 17%. And then there are premium panels that do even better. So inverter architecture, I try to make a cartoon here to, to show some of the important concepts that, that we need to know. Uh, first of all, we saw the solar PV panel. It converts sunlight into direct current. And then there's a thing called an MPPT function. 
Uh, are any of you engineers? Any engineers? Good. So this is kind of like impedance matching. It turns out that the solar panel, the, the voltage and the current that it generates varies with sunlight and with temperature. So you really need to, to keep the load on that panel right at the optimum point in order to extract the most power from it and convert it into energy for the house. So the green thing here, this is an MPPT function. It's, it's not a separate box. It's usually part of uh, an inverter. The inverter is the red thing. It converts DC from the panels into, into AC at a 60 hertz rate. And unlike what some people think of inverters from the old days, it generates a very nice uh, sinusoid. And it's not a square wave like the old inverters used to be. And then we have wires. They're all copper, but I just identified them so you can tell which are DC. So the string inverter uh, architecture has been around for a couple of decades, and many of the systems out there have worked this way for, for many years. We saw that the cells in the panel are connected in series, and in turn, the panels are connected in series. So this generates a fairly high uh, DC voltage, which goes into the inverter and the MPPT function is performed on the entire array. So one of the problems is that all the panels might be a little different, either because of their shading or because of their manufacturer. So it, it kind of takes the least common denominator of all those panels. You can also have two smaller inverters for better reliability and, and shading tolerance. Around 2008, the microinverter came along. And the idea here is to break this, instead of having a, a single one or two big inverter, you have an inverter behind each panel, and each one has its own MPPT function. So now all the panels can be tracked independently, providing much better performance and tolerance of, of shade. Then a f about five years or so later, uh, the DC optimizer architecture came out. Now this one, it goes back to the, the single central inverter, but it splits up the MPPT function. There's a part of it that's with each panel, so it can deal with each panel's unique characteristics and a, a part that's, that's back in the, the central inverter. Uh, so let's see what happens when we get a shadow. Um, with the string inverter, the output of the whole system drastically reduces, even though just one panel is shadowed. Whereas with either the microinverter or the DC optimizer, most of the system keeps working as if nothing happened. So you have most of the output still available. So this is, this is one of the big advantages. Now, one of the reasons that we, we, we like solar flares is because they, they offer all three of these alternatives. Some of the other of the seven candidate installers, only some only offered microinverters, some, one even offered only optimizers. But Solar Flare has all of these in their repertoire and, and they will talk about all the pros and cons. And we could spend the whole rest of the evening just talking about microinverters versus optimizers. It's kind of like Macs versus PCs or, or, uh, or Fords versus Chevys or, or but uh, each has its advantages and disadvantages. But Solar Flare will work with you, and, and they'll recommend the best for you, and uh, you can have you can have it your way. So next, I want to introduce uh, Chris Ciano. All right, what I want to talk about is the installation I did in my house, which is uh, 9,945 watts. It's kind of at the high end of what we're uh, probably installing for most houses here in Bolton although there are some larger homes that have larger systems. Um, when I started out, I was looking for information more than anything. I was, I was wooed by all of those uh, get solar free ads and uh, no money down, that kind of thing. So I actually interviewed almost 16 different companies. Most of them never even came to my house. They simply looked at a satellite picture and said, ah, we can install this for X number of dollars. The problem was, is they really didn't explain the systems to me. And so I had to go out and do a lot of research. My biggest concern, my home does not face south. So how was I going to get the most power out of my solar? My house is southwest. Turns out, as long as I am below that parallel from east to west, I can get solar. In fact, I probably make more power by pointing southwest 
than a lot of houses do with pointing south. Morning haze reduces the amount of soul you can get in the morning. I don't get any morning sunlight, so it really doesn't affect me. But I can see the sun until it sets late in the afternoon, and that gives me a longer day in the afternoon. I put 39 panels on my roof, which is a little bit high number. If I were to do it today under your program, I'd use two less panels and spend $2,000 less. That was only two years ago that I did that. That's how much the cost is coming down, and that's how much you guys are going to save the other residents. Um, that uh, 9,000 watts that I put up there was put up there in, in ideas that I was going to add an a, uh, expansion to my home, which is currently in the architect's drawings. And if oil gets too expensive, it would allow me in the future to power something like uh, geothermal heat, which uses an electric heat pump type technology. So I'm thinking a little bit ahead. So I've got a lot of extra capacity here, which is giving me a little bit of credit. Down in my basement, there's a bunch of uh, pieces that, that make the system work. Under each panel, I have a DC optimizer. Those are all combined together, goes into the inverter, and the inverter talks to every single one of those panels so that the, the uh, inverter is presented with a very consistent voltage from the roof. And that makes this type of an inverter very, very efficient. Over 98% efficiency from the sunlight hitting my panel to the power that I put out uh, through my meter. And that's a, that's a huge improvement above the string inverter, which sometimes can't even do 80%, depending upon the, sh the shading that the, the system sees at the time. All of that goes out of production meter, just like with Tony's. I look at that once a month, I type in that number on a website, and a, a quarter later, I get a check in the mail for the SREX that I'm producing. And it doesn't matter if I use the power or I put the power out on the grid. Whatever I produce, that's what counts for my SREX. So the more capacity I have, the quicker those SREX come in, the more money we'll get, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. My system is actually connected between my electrical panel and the meter. So I have to have another breaker box. I flip that breaker. My system is completely isolated. So if you're doing home repairs or there's a problem, it's a flip of a switch either in your breaker panel or on a separate breaker panel and your system is completely offline. It's not like the old days where somebody had to come in and start removing wires. More advanced technologies allow you to monitor your system very, very closely. I can see very quickly whether all my panels are online and if they're working okay. I can see what kind of voltage my inverter is getting. Am I still within range? Is it working properly? And all these things will actually get emailed to me if I ignore it. So I'll know these things whether or not I look at the, meet, uh, the inverter or the monitoring system does it for me. It tells me that the, um, the utility is within spec in terms of frequency. It tells me whether it's in spec in terms of voltage, and I match that. So the power that I'm generating is exactly the same as you're getting from the utility out in the pole, except that all of my neighbors on a really bright sunny day are being powered by my house. Here's the big one, my internal temperature, and I keep an eye on this one. The thing that'll kill your inverter is getting too warm. By keeping an eye on the temperature, you can determine if it needs to be cleaned out from dust, if one of your fans might be going down. So this is all preventive maintenance stuff. Generally speaking, you don't have to do a thing. But all I do is hit the button every once in a while and go, oh, temperature's in range, I'm good. And then I have the amount of power that I'm producing at the moment. And this picture was actually kind of hard to take because that number changes so often I was getting blurry images at that point. Um, 7,000 watts at that particular moment, the next second it could be higher, it could be lower. It all depends on the randomness of those photons striking the panels on the roof and producing power. But it doesn't matter what that variability is. The inverter handles it, changes it into nice clean AC for my home, and the rest of it gets dumped out onto the grid and my meter spins backwards. In fact, my meter is spinning backwards more times than it's spinning forwards, it seems. Um, my monitoring software allows me to see as I go through the year what my monthly output across the years are, and I can compare. Take a look at the winter of uh, February 19, uh, 2015. My panels were under snow half that month, but I still managed to produce almost a half a, a megawatt of electricity. As soon as the sun comes out, those panels 
dump their snow load, and they start producing again. In fact, colder days produces more electricity than warmer days. My highest peak energy occurs in March, not in the middle of the summer. I see peaks over 11,000 watts in March. That's more than my system is supposed to produce, but the conditions are ideal for solar. And you can see from my March readings, they spike way up at that time of the year. I can also see dailies with that kind of a chart, but this is the one that's most interesting. This is dailies across a week, and it, these are all little points of, during the day. It simply picks a very specific time of day and says, what's my output then? On a rainy day, I don't make a lot of power, but I'm still making power. That represents a little more than half my daily load in my household. So half of my power that I used on that drizzle, rainy day was covered. I didn't have to draw from the grid for that. On a mostly cloudy day, it spikes all over the place, but I more than cover what my household requires on those days. If I have a nice sunny day, I get a nice even curve, nice peak in the middle of the day, nice and even. A couple of fluctuations there, passing cloud here and there. The thing is though, is those were warm days, those were days in the 60s. Notice the peaks don't quite go as high as that one on May 9th. And the reason is, is on warmer days, the panels aren't quite as efficient. However, on cool, sunny days, you get nice high peaks. This one here topped out at uh, 9,700 watt, uh, 700 watts. Actually, I saw peaks above 10,000 watts on that day. It just didn't happen to hit the, uh, the particular moment that they, they took a snapshot of these graphs. So, you're going to produce power. It doesn't matter whether or not there's beautiful weather or whether or not there's dismal weather. Um, one of the things here on this particular graph, it shows out during the day. Or my early morning, I don't even see the sun. It's behind a hill, it's behind trees until about 10 o'clock in the morning. But I'm producing power. There's about 400 watts coming off my roof. That 400 watts more than makes up for the couple of lights that I have on and maybe the coffee maker as it's starting to brew in the morning. Okay? It doesn't matter as long as that sun's above the horizon, I'm making some kind of power. Later on, I get that ramp up. That ramp up is that sun coming up above the trees and they start filling in the panels from left to right and the panels start producing more and more power. Then along come the clouds. That red bar you see there is the snapshot of what my, each of my panels was producing at that point in the day. And I picked this specifically because it was a very spotty, cloudy day you'll see that some panels were as low as 72 watts. If I had a string inverter, all my panels would be at 72 watts. I'd never see 186 watts being produced anywhere. I wouldn't have the ability to have that kind of energy. By using one of the panel mounted adapters, you can maximize all your efficiency across your entire grid so that instead of producing 2,800 watts, I'm producing 7,000 watts in this condition. So if you have any kind of a shadowing issue, please consider adding this upgrade. At the maximum, at a system my size, you're talking $1,300, $1,400. It's not a lot compared to the price of the system, but it makes a huge difference in how much output you're going to get from that system. Here's the big kicker. I only have two or three months a year where I don't cover my energy costs. That's my meter moving forward. The rest of the time it moves back. Uh, this year it happened to be two months because I was in Maui for two weeks in December. That was paid for with the SREX from one year's worth of production. We paid for our plane tickets, and we paid, paid for our car rental, and we paid for some dinners out in Maui, just out of the SREX account that we, we set up. You'll notice up there, no bill. Zero. That's what I pay a month. I will never pay another electric bill again in my house. I produce far too much. In fact, I'm sitting on a $600 credit right now. I looked at that and went, wait a minute, we don't have the addition done yet. I'm not replacing my heat anytime soon. I'm, I'm, I'm building a credit far too quickly here. I gotta do something about this. There's some way that this can pay me back. So what did I do? I contacted my church and I said, hey, give me your uh, electric account. I'm gonna link my solar to your electric account and I'm gonna give you my excess each month from now on. I keep my current credit, but from now on, my excess every month goes and pays as my church's electric bill. That's a donation. That's a tax write-off. That pays off my system even sooner. 
So understand, there are ways to use your system to not only cover your electric bill, make green energy, help the planet, but also in the far end, make you some money. Go solar. It's the only investment you can make in your house that'll pay itself off before the warranty's out and then keep paying you back long after. And from now, we're going to go over to uh, Elizabeth, and her presentation. Uh, so thank you uh, for having me here tonight. My name is Elizabeth Youngblood. I am a senior project manager on the solar team at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And I wanted to start by just uh, saying thank you to uh, Tony and Sharon and, and the volunteer team for all of the work that you've done to date, uh, coming in for the volunteer trainings and putting in, I know, hundreds of hours and many more to come certainly, and, and for the town of Golden for uh, administering this program. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, tonight I'm going to uh, talk over a few things. I think that uh, Tony and Chris did an excellent job about going over the basics of solar, actually in a lot more detail than uh, even I was going to do. So uh, thank you for that. And also, Tony, I'm very uh, envious that you're number one. I, that's always <laughs> been something I've wanted. So it's, it's on my bucket list. So hopefully I can catch up to you on that. So. I'm um, going to give an overview of the Solarize Massachusetts program. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about solar basics. I did cut some of that out. Um, solar incentives and then getting started. And then I'm going to turn it over to the competitively selected installer of solar fire. Uh, a little bit about the Mass Clean Energy Center. We are a quasi-state agency, which means we were created by an act of legislation, which is the 2008 Green Jobs Act. But we get our funding from uh, what's called the Renewable Energy Trust, which is a systems benefit charge on ratepayer electric bills. Uh, it's 0 .0005 cents per kilowatt hour, or about 15 cents uh, per month, 15 to 30 around um, on electric bills for ratepayers. Um, so the money goes into a fund uh, that we use uh, to administer our programs. We're tasked with growing the clean energy economy in Massachusetts, um, and we do this in a number of ways. We have an investments team uh, that provides small uh, venture capital funds for uh, startup companies, many coming out of our uh, colleges and universities. We have an innovation industry support team uh, that works on workforce development. Uh, we also have a month or an annual report that we put out on kind of the health of the industry. It's kind of our report card, if you will. Um, we also have uh, the division that I work in, which is called renewable energy generation. Um, and we're really focused on getting steel in the ground. So we offer a number of uh, programs that are focused on um, various incentives, so wind, solar, electric, solar hot water, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, uh, talk, uh, definitely look at our incentive programs, um, and, and the Solarize Massachusetts program, uh, which was launched in 2011, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. Actually, can you hit it one more time? Perfect. All right, uh, so the Solarize Mass program was started in 2011. Uh, we, um, as an organization, were actually looking at Portland, Oregon, um, which did this first Solarize program. It was actually a community-based program. They uh, brought a neighborhood together in Portland and competitively selected an installer that then offered them reduced pricing. We found this to be really interesting and we wanted to pilot it in uh, communities in Massachusetts. So in 2011, which was the year that I was brought on board, uh, we piloted this program in four different communities, one in each region of the state. Uh, one of the communities was actually um, Harvard, Mass, which I know is right next door. Um, that was actually a very successful program. Uh, they ended up, I think, at the time, contracting for 75 systems uh, through that program, and we decided that we would continue this program, and now it's in its sixth iteration. Um, so far, we uh, worked in 51 different towns and communities across the um, Massachusetts, and Bolton is one of them this round. Um, so the goals of the Solarize Mass program are to increase education and outreach around solar. Um, having you in the room tonight is a great example. Thank you for carving some time out of your day to, to come in and learn about uh, solar. Uh, that's one of the big pieces is really just kind of understanding how this technology works and how it could potentially work for your home. Um, this is a model that can simplify the process. Uh, we've heard from, you know, a number of people that, uh, you know, essentially we, we do, we go through a, um, this is actually tied more to the reduced time to contract. It can take a person anywhere from, you know, one to two to frankly 20 years to decide to go solar from kind of the initial interest to getting bids uh, to, you know, getting the kids to soccer practice, doing various other things, and ultimately deciding to go solar. Through this program, it is a limited time program. It goes for about six months. Um, 
more or less a sign up period, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. But um, there's a limited time to participate, and then the uh, the program will close. So um, this will actually um, move communities forward in, in the number of solar systems. But I will talk about that in a minute. Um, reduced installation costs. Uh, we have run this program, as I said, over several years, and we've seen um, reductions in about uh, the 18 to 20 percent range um, on average between average prices for solar in the industry and through the Solar as Mass program. Um, and increased adoption. Um, and as you see on the next slide, uh, most of the communities that have participated have doubled the amount of solar in their community. So how does this model work? Uh, I've heard a number of people come up and say, okay, so this is, this is Groupon for solar. And I just don't like Groupon at all. I mean, I, get, I was getting all those emails, didn't really like it. But the idea is that if you look to the left here, um, you know, this is kind of the installation stack, uh, the cost of installing solar. You have the kind of upfront installation costs of actually getting the crew to the site to install the system. You've got the sales and the marketing and the customer acquisition piece, uh, the soft costs of permitting, utility, interconnection, any sort of rebates or incentives that the installer has to do, and then the equipment costs. So the cost of buying the inverter and the panels. Uh, they may be doing that purchasing them at the retail rate. Um, solarized mass uh, really does crunch the cost staff. Uh, the installation costs go down a, a little bit. Uh, the installer will be doing a lot of installations in the town and can kind of focus on one installation and uh, go you know, three to blocks over for an inspection and then come back and do things like that. Um, really, it's the marketing and customer acquisition costs. So um, by doing a lot of outreach and education about solar, the installer is greatly able to reduce their their costs for um, getting leads through this program. Um, additionally, soft costs can go down a bit. Um, you know, the, the um, installer will work with the, the town municipal department to really understand what is the permitting process and will likely expedite that process by knowing exactly what they need to do um, to, to move forward with the permit, um, as well as equipment costs. Uh, by knowing that you're going to be installing 20, 30, 40 systems, you're able to get economies of scale and kind of reduce to be able to purchase kind of that wholesale rate, the, the cost of solar. So that really, as I said, reduces the, the cost stack and the additional savings can then be passed along to the consumer. So. All right, here's the, here's the 51 towns and communities across Massachusetts. Um, we've seen a pretty good distribution across the state, um, some on the Cape, uh, many around the kind of Boston metro area and in Western Mass. Um, we've seen about uh, 2,600 contracts signed for 17 megawatts of capacity. And I just want to say, you know, 17 megawatts, you know, what does that even mean? Well, in the state as a whole, there's about 1,000 megawatts installed right now. Um, so the idea that hundreds of homeowners could contract to go solar and, you know, be 1.7% of the total capacity in the state, I think is just a very empowering thing. Hope you guys can see this, but basically this is the last 51 towns and communities that have participated in um, the red. If you can see it there, that is the amount of solar uh, that had been installed in the community prior to Solarize Massachusetts. And the, the blue on top of that was the amount of contracted, I'm sorry, the number of systems in, uh, contracted through the program. So in uh, 43 of the 51 communities, the amount of, this is small scale solar, doubled in that town. Um, Bolton, uh, I'm actually going to turn to Tony here. Bol Bolton, how many, how many? Um, 75. 75 systems installed. Um, so I think, you know, you are, you know, very much on track potentially to double that through this program. I, I put that out there as a challenge. <laughs> Great. Um, so I just want to go through the different uh, roles of the different parties in this program. Uh, there is the Mass Clean Energy Center and the Department of Energy Resources. Uh, we're partnered together under as part of Solarize Mass. Um, we issue the request for proposals, asking communities to apply to be part of this program. Uh, we also offer, um, we work with a technical consultant, so the technical consultant will basically engage with the community to help put together the request for proposals to select the installer. Um, we also provide um, marketing and education, so we'll do a, a volunteer training. Um, we have uh, provided marketing grant to the town of $5,000 um, in, in two pieces. Um, and then we offer what's called the SREC2 program, which is the state incentive program as well. Uh, the installer is the technical expert. They've been competitively selected through a bidding process. Uh, as Tony mentioned, there were seven bids in, in Bolton. Um, they will provide pre-site assessments, uh, tiered pricing, and ownership options. So 
We'll talk a little bit about what tier pricing is in a minute. They'll contract with you and then they will provide you with the turnkey service agreement. So they'll go, um, you know, do all the permits and help you go through the whole process of going solar. Uh, the community is uh, very much a critical piece of this program. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the volunteer team alone will be putting in a lot of time to get the word out about the program. Um, they put out an installer RFP. Uh, they went through an installer selection process with the technical consultant. Um, Tony is the solar coach. He's kind of the captain of the ship um, with you know, many talented volunteers under him. Um, volunteer team and outreach to the community. So um, if you haven't, sign up for emails to know about uh, upcoming events and uh, other information about the program. And then the, the last partner here is really um, residents in Bolton. Um, you know, your role is to sign up for a site assessment and see if you have a good site for solar and also just to talk to your neighbors and let them know about this program. As of right now, um, we have actually closed the number of, sorry, we've, um, we've accepted a number of communities, four communities in one community grouping, uh, Natick, Somerville, Bolton, Medfield, and then a partnership of three communities, Shelburne, Coleraine, and Conway. Um, through this program, we, uh, we see what's called tier pricing. So as more people go solar in the town, uh, the cost goes down for everybody. Um, so if you look at kind of this tier one through tier five, uh, this is looking at contracted capacity, but if you assume the average system is about 5,000 watt system or five kilowatts, we're just gonna assume that for now. Uh, I know that, Chris, you had a 9.8 kilowatt system. 9.9. 9.9, okay. So there will be some that are smaller and some that are larger. But just, you know, on average five kilowatts, um, you know, tier one will be upwards of five systems, tier two is uh, six to 10, 11 to, what's that, 20? 11 to 20, 20 to 40, and then 40 plus. So that's, that's kind of the range there. I, I will say that um, in the last several rounds, every community, except for one, I believe, made it to tier five pricing. So it's, um, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great, Thing to use at the same time, I, I'm you know there's a pretty strong possibility that you're going to get there relatively fast. Um, there is a predetermined deadline during this program, as I mentioned, uh, for each community and for Bolton. Uh, the the deadline to sign a contract under this program is October 31st. All right, so I'm going to provide a little bit in Solar Basics. Uh, mostly, I'm going to talk about um, some of the incentives and then pass it over to Solar Blair. All right, um, so I just want to take a giant step back and just talk about energy. The left uh, is, a, um, is the annual amount of electric, or not even electricity, energy consumption in the world. It's uh, 16 uh, terawatt years of energy per year. Um, so you can see that number 16, that's what's being consumed every year. Um, all the way to the left, all the way to the right here are the um, total amount of energy reserves that we know about in the world. Um, this includes coal, uranium, petroleum, that's ANWR, up in Alaska, natural gas. And that's really all that we have. Um, in the middle here are kind of the known annual reserves of renewable energy resources. So this is kind of what we know about right now. And that includes wind, waves, ocean thermal energy current, biomass, hydro, geothermal, tides. Then you've got the sun. And as Tony mentioned, uh, there is a tremendous resource that's hitting the earth every day. Um, there's enough solar hitting the earth every day to basically, you know, provide us electricity for the entire year. It's just a matter of uh, being able to capture it. Um, a question that I receive often is, well, that's great that there's a lot of solar in the world, but what about in Massachusetts? Do we really have enough solar resource um, to make solar a financial option, a financially viable option in Massachusetts? And the answer is yes. Um, we don't have the same amount of resource as the Southwest, which is kind of a bright red. We're right kind of in the middle of the spectrum in a kind of, yeah, that's, that's the bright red. But it's also very hot. See, very hot, actually not that good for the panels. Um, so we're right in the middle. Um, but if you look at the, the far right, you have Germany, which actually has less solar resource than anywhere in the United States, including Alaska. And they are one of the countries that installs, um, they're one of the, the countries that has the largest number of solar installations. So um, if they can make it happen, then we can as well. Massachusetts also has uh, very high electricity prices. Uh, we're one of the highest, uh, as, as well as a lot of New England states as well. Um, I believe there in 2014 we were eighth highest. 
Um, and part of the reason for this is that we don't have any native resources. So we don't have any oil, natural gas, um, coal, you know, coal mines in our backyards, for better or for worse. Um, we have to pipe in a lot of our electricity from, from elsewhere. Um, we also have an aging infrastructure um, electrical system that constantly needs to be upgraded. Um, to the right here is a, a chart looking at electricity prices over the past 20 years, and on average, uh, the average price has gone up about 3% per year. Um, as you can tell, it has, it's, it's not a, a clear linear line, but on average it does go up. Uh, there was a little bit of a dip there with the incorporation of natural gas fracking, um, but we've seen yeah, a continued spike um, to, to um, that was actually the, uh, we, we have so much natural gas coming into Massachusetts that sometimes our um, electricity consumption and our gas consumption uh, can be at odds with each other, especially in the winter months when it's coldest. So we do see some energy spikes there. Um, but in general, we, as I said, we will continue to have to upgrade the electrical system here, and it is likely that the cost for electricity will continue to go up. Um, over the past 10 years, we've seen uh, prices for solar panels and inverters, the kind of hard costs, continue to go down over time. Um, when I started in the industry in 2009, we were seeing prices, you know, around, uh, you know, eight, nine dollars a watt. Um, and now in the industry, we're seeing, you know, between four and five dollars a watt on average. Um, and I'll, I'll let Solar Flare talk about their pricing relatively soon. And as a result, we've actually seen the number of systems in Massachusetts uh, really um, skyrocket. This is through 2015, uh, where we saw about 12,000 12, systems being installed. And I believe our total number of residential systems in the, in the state is around uh, 38,000 systems right now. So it's, it's uh, definitely growing uh, and growing every month, which is really exciting. So this is a, one way to visualize it, the yellow dots from 2006. There's a few hundred systems and about uh, five megawatts of capacity. <coughs> and this is through 2014, but you can kind of see the, the, the breakout of where the systems are, which is actually uh, relatively well distributed across the, the state. All right. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of the incentives that are available. Um, as mentioned before, uh, Massachusetts has high electricity prices. Uh, we've seen the cost of solar go down. Um, and there are a number of um, you know, good incentives in the state right now for solar. And so th those combined really make for an economical uh, solar project. So here's the kind of incentive stack. Um, I actually talked with Solar Flare beforehand. They're gonna speak to um, SREC sales and net metering. Uh, I'm gonna talk about state and federal tax incentives and the Mass Solar Loan Program. And a little bit about loan and there's no money down options. Um, so the federal tax credit um, was recently uh, extended through uh, the end of 2019. And then, uh, so if you do, now these books that we were, so these are from Mass Clean Energy Center and we recently printed them and literally two days after we printed them, the federal tax credit got extended from 2016 to 2019. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Just know that it's been extended. Um, so the federal tax credit is valued at 30% the total cost of the system. It is a credit on your, um, your taxes. So you do need, do need to have a tax appetite. Um, there is also a state tax credit. Um, it's 15% of the total system cost, but it's capped at $1,000. So it's about $1,000. Um, and so let me just jump to lower no money down options. Uh, this is relating to um, third party ownership. So there are kind of two major models in Massachusetts with regards to ownership. There's direct ownership, and then there's third party ownership. Um, third party ownership is looking at either a lease or a power purchase agreement. Um, a lease is similar to leasing a car. You're leasing the panels on the roof, and then you get the electricity that they produce monthly. Um, power purchase agreement is just as it sounds. You are agreeing to purchase the power at a reduced rate. Um, so there may be reasons to do um, either of these. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the kind of value proposition of ownership shortly. Um, you know, one reason why you might consider third party ownership might be if you, for example, don't have a tax appetite and can't take advantage of that federal tax credit. That's, that's kind of one reason why we, we might see someone go for a third party ownership uh, structure. And there's other reasons as well, and, and people can talk to both. And we, we can sit up here and have a discussion, but you know, I've already been talking for half an hour, so we'll keep going. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the Mass Solar Loan Program. This was launched in December of last year. Uh, it is a partnership between the Department of Energy Resources and the Mass Clean Energy Center. Um, it's a $30 million program. Um, it's going to last for around three years. And it's really focused on um, basically uh, bringing more, uh, there's, there's several goals actually. One is to um, bring more uh, financing institutions into the market, into this space. Um, to, to get them to offer low interest loans and to, agree, uh, to increase access for, for consumers. Um, several years ago, DOER issued a study on kind of the, the value proposition or the, um, the revenue stream of owning versus leasing or power purchase, having a power purchase agreement for solar. And what they found was that um, there was a lot more benefit that was accrued by the homeowner if they own the system. And not only that, but there was more value for the community and the state as a whole. Um, by owning that system versus having uh, having those incentives go to that third party provider. So that was part of the impetus for the launch of the Mass Solar Loan Program. Um, so the lenders that are participating in the program, it's not us that actually offers the loan. Um, they are they're offering different loan products through their standard underwriting processes and there are three different incentives that we're offering, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about. One is called the interest rate buy down, um, one is the income based loan support, and, and one is the loan loss reserve. Um, for the second and third piece, um, there is uh, an additional incentive for uh, homeowners that um, you know are moderate uh, or low income. So, if you generally if you make less than let's say eighty thousand dollars a year, um, you may be eligible for the, the income based loan support. Um, the loan loss reserve is um, seeking to kind of expand the scope of kind of who can participate in. Uh, getting a loan through through a local lender. So basically, if you have a certain credit score that's a little bit lower than standard practices, uh, MassCC would put some funds aside um, to offer in case, uh, for some reason, that, that individual did not pay off their loan. So let's talk about the interest rate buy-down, because that is available to, to anyone coming through the program. So the lender that is offering the loan has to offer at least a 10-year term. Uh, they could offer a longer term or a shorter term if they want, and many do, but they have to offer at least a 10-year term. Um, they have to offer you know, a maximum of the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal Prime plus 2.75% interest rate limit. So that's around 6% right now in the industry. Um, but installers, sorry, installers, lenders can offer less than that. So you might find a lender that's offering four or five 3%, something like that. And um, they can offer loans up to $35,000. Um, they're required to offer a loan up to $35,000. They may offer more. Um, and they disperse 35% of the principal at the closing of, of the loan, and there's a 12-month interest-only period. Um, there can only be a maximum of $500 in closing costs. Um, I think I might have deleted something here, kind of what is the incentive here? So. At this time, uh, we are offering a 3% buy-down of that, of that loan. Um, so yes, it was launched in December of 2015. Uh, we've seen more than 900 projects apply so far. We have 12 participating lenders, I believe. Um, Clinton Savings Bank is one of the lenders. Um, and there are 79 installers, uh, including Solar Flare, that are participating under the Mass Solar Loan Program. So next steps, really, talk to Solar Flare, but sign up for email updates um, and for a free solar site assessment. Also consider signing up if you haven't already for a um, energy audit. They are free through Mass Save. Um, so try to reduce your consumption before you install solar. You can, it's a kind of a low hanging fruit. Um, and then also consider options if solar is not feasible. Each town's a little bit different, but we've seen anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of homes just not be a feasible site for solar. So, um, as I mentioned, we have a number of different incentive programs: air source heat pump, ground source heat pump. Hot water can be a little more forgiving if it's just a shaded site because it's, it's consuming the heat, not the electricity, the photons, if you will. Um, so, to take a look at other options as well. Also, you can volunteer with the team. I'll put that plug in now as well. If, if you want to participate but aren't able to go solar yourself. And uh, tell your neighbors and friends about the program as well. The, my contact information is there, and I'll be available for questions afterwards. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Dan Burnett who will give the solar flare presentation. After that, we'll have questions and answers. 
So I want to first thank everyone that came out this evening. I know it's, uh, it's a weekday and, and everyone wants to be at home, so I'll keep this uh, as quickly, quick as I can. But I also want to thank the uh, Solarize team uh, for selecting Solar Flare. So as you know, at this point, uh, this is a grassroots roots, roots effort, so it takes the involvement of the community uh, to make these programs successful by spreading the word. A little bit about Solar Flare is that we are headquartered in Ashland, Massachusetts, so not too far down the road, maybe about a 20 to 30 minute drive. Uh, we're nice and close, so if there are any issues, you know we're, we're right nearby. We moved into this building uh, about two years ago now, and right when we moved in, we installed an 80 kilowatt system on the roof. Now, this is a, it's a flat roof system. Um, however, it, it does produce enough power to cover our entire building's usage. So not only are we installing on your homes and local businesses, but we're also installing on our own uh, building as well. So we definitely uh, walk the talk. Our, our goal at Solar Flare, number one, is to empower individuals like yourself to make that switch to clean energy by powering their home, business, or institution. And I'm working with the owner now to, to add in car to that list, because that's something that's come about uh, in the last couple of years. Number two, overall, reduce our dependence on carbon-based fuels, such as oil and coal. You know, that's why we're making this switch, so that we don't have to build as many coal-fired power plants. Accelerate the transition to clean energy through programs like the Solarize Mass program. Reduce the effects of global climate change, so really setting up uh, future generations um, to make sure they're living in a, a good environment. And lastly, providing an opportunity uh, for individuals like yourself that are passionate about uh, these issues to make a tangible impact on the community. So you're setting an example for the community when you install solar on your house. As the two pictures show there, we install both residential and commercial size systems. So anywhere from as small as a 12 panel system, all the way up to the largest system we've installed is a ground mounted system in Charlton that's uh, considered a two megawatt system. And we send that power to a local university where they receive uh, discounted rates on that power. So not only do we own a system on our roof, but we also own multiple ground mounted and large roof mounted projects. So we really believe in this technology and that really shows by us investing uh, in it ourselves. We've installed over 850 residential projects uh, in Massachusetts. So we have plenty of examples and two of those examples are here in Bolton. Soon to be three. Yeah. <laughs> So a little bit more about Solar Flare. Like I had mentioned, uh, we did move to that uh, Ashland office recently. However, we were founded in 2007. The owner and his wife, Matt Arner, and, and Minnie uh, started the company in their, their house there in Hockington. And then we moved into a, biz, uh, into a building in Framingham where we shared uh, the office space with a company called the NAMAC Corporation. Now eventually, we got so big, we took up more space in the building than they did. So they said, hey, it's time to get your own building. And that's what we did. So that's why we moved to Ash. We are a NAPSEP certified installer. So that stands for North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioner. So you, you definitely want to make sure uh, that you're, you're certified. We have our home improvement contractors license because we are performing work on your home. We have our construction supervisors license as well. We have nine licensed electricians on staff. So the work is completed in-house. And of course, with those nine, we have to have the master electrician's license in order to uh, employ those nine. All of our staff, including our office members, are OSHA 10-hour safety certified. So if they are climbing on ladders and, and potentially even on your roof, if you have a lower pitched uh, roof, uh, know that we are certified to do so and, and we know how to do so safely. And lastly, if you are building a new uh, home, we do have uh, one lead accredited professional uh, that can help you uh, determine the, the point scale there. So the next, this slide here just really is going back to the basics. I know that we covered a lot, so I won't spend too much time here. 
but you have two major components in a solar PV system. You have the panels on your roof, which are producing the direct current, the DC power, uh, and then you have the inverter or inverters. With microinverters, the inverters are located on the back of each panel, so you're converting that, inverting that energy from DC to AC at roof level. Versus with the central inverter, you're converting, inverting that energy uh, in your basement where the central inverter is located. So in real time, you will be using the power that your system produces in your house in real time. Once you leave for the day, uh, you're turning appliances off, you're turning your, your AC off, uh, that power will be going back to the grid. That goes back to the grid through a bi-directional meter like Tony had showed a picture of. And that meter tracks how much you've given back to the electric company. The electric company then uh, gives you credits on your electric bill. So you, you should have, hopefully, a bill that looks like this after you've installed solar. So this is one of our uh, clients in Franklin that had a, a very large bill anywhere from $200 to $400 a month. Now, as you can see, or, or maybe you can't see, but I'll point it out, at the bottom there, they have a $0 bill. So it is possible to have a $0 bill. And they also have a credit, similar to what Chris showed you. Not, not quite as large as Chris's credit, uh, but they still have a credit of $60 that can then be used in months like December when the, the sun isn't shining as much. To quickly just go over the benefits of solar, you're providing energy independence for yourself. So right now you're receiving that electric bill and you're looking at it going, what do I do about this? Well, really right now without solar, the, there's only one answer, which is to pay the bill. Once you get solar, hopefully we can size it, uh, if your roof allows, to uh, offset 100% of your annual utility usage. In that case, you're providing an option for yourself. Uh, you've installed solar, and now you don't have to pay that bill. Job creation. So like programs, uh, programs like the Solarize programs have really helped company, local companies like Solar Flare uh, grow as a business. So it, it, it does create a lot of local jobs. Reduce electrical demand during peak hours. Now, we, we don't always want to help the utility, but what this is doing is, when you're installing solar, especially during peak hours, the utility is saying, hey, we don't need to build another coal-fired power plant because we have these solar customers kind of making up the difference. So you are helping in that sense um, by not, not giving them the opportunity to, to build another coal-fired power plant. And lastly, it's clean renewable energy. It's good for the environment. So you're, you know that looking at the big picture, you are doing good for the environment. The next two slides, I'm going to talk about what a good site for solar is and what a bad site for solar is. So these two pictures, this picture and the next one, are both simply satellite images. This first one, the front roof, is facing slightly east because 180 degrees is directly south. 160 degrees is still mostly south but tilted slightly to the east. We call that the azimuth. So we're looking for azimuths between, say, 120 and 240 are good sites uh, or have, have the best capability of, of return on investment. Um, certainly on a north-facing side, you're not going to get much sun. Um, so we, we don't recommend that. But similar to Chris's situation, even on that back roof that kind of faces the pool, yes, it is uh, southwesterly facing. But they're still getting a lot of sunlight because both of these roofs don't have much shading to deal with. There's no large trees around, uh, there's no uh, skylights, there's no uh, chimneys, so you don't have a lot of shade. So these are two, both of these roofs, that front-facing roof, as well as the back one that faces southwest, would both be good candidates for solar. Now this is an example of a, a bad uh, roof for solar, and mainly because there's a lot of, of trees, um, and the trees almost look like as if they, they overhang uh, on the roof a little bit. 
So this is a bad site because of that shading. Um, we're certainly not the type of company that wants to come in and say, hey, you should remove these seven trees uh, to install solar. Um, that, that's not what we're looking to do. But one thing to keep in mind is that if you do end up deciding to remove one or two trees, that your system will offset quite a bit of uh, carbon dioxide. So we will show that um, in your proposal. Uh, and you can, you know, in, in our proposal, it translates that to how many trees have been planted, which is definitely a lot. That number is always a lot more than two. So you're, you're making up the difference there. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you are interested in the Massachusetts Solar Loan Program, that uh, you have a 70% or higher uh, solar access reading. And I'll go, go over that a little bit more in the next slide. So when Tom or Charlie, which you, you met when you came in, comes out to your home for your free site assessment, they will bring with them a sole metric sun eye, it's called. They extend it up to your roof level uh, on a pole, spin it around, and it's going to take this picture here. This picture tells us where the sun is going to be uh, and at what time of the year. So this, one, this particular site faces uh, pretty much directly south. So you can see right in the center there you have uh, 12 o'clock high noon. And this is a very good site. So uh, really from, you know, from say uh, 7 o'clock until uh, the evening, this, especially in the summertime, this site is getting very good sun. So this has a 95% solar access out of 100. Now if there were uh, trees in the area, you would see more green because the green is what's, uh, that, that's the tool telling us, hey, there's shading in this area. Um, so we can provide this, it uh, comes in a PDF uh, report. We can provide this to you uh, if you are interested uh, in seeing this report. But this is what you will get and this is how we determine your uh, annual estimated uh, production. When we come out for that free site assessment, one thing that we're really looking to do is, and this is really to benefit, you know, make sure it benefits you uh, the most, is installing at least eight panels. So although these are uh, you know, beautiful homes, they have great architecture, there's not a lot of space for solar panels up there. So it's important to remember that a standard solar panel is typically five feet tall by three and a half feet wide. So keep that in mind when you're looking at your roof. Um, do, you, do you think you have enough space to install uh, panels up there, at least eight of them? The next two slides I'm gonna go over how we make our roof penetrations um, because we, we have to do these in order to attach uh, panels to your roof. So on the left side you have a good uh, roof penetration, so that's the way solar flare does it. On the right side, you have a bad uh, roof penetration. The reason why the right side is a bad roof penetration is because they're not using any type of flashing. Whereas on the left side, the one that, that we've installed, uses a piece of flashing that will slide under uh, the shingles and hit the third course of shingles. So it's, it's really slid under there far. And keep in mind, you'll, you'll hear this from uh, Tom or Charlie when they come uh, and, and give you a proposal, but we do have a 10-year workmanship warranty. So if anything happens with your system, uh, regardless of you know, what it has to do with, uh, we will come out and fix it, no charge. So this is a step-by-step -step, uh, picture process of how we're going to make that uh, roof penetration. First, we're going to create chalk lines uh, to mark where the rafters are. We figure out where the rafters are uh, by going into your attic and actually measuring out each, each rafter so we know the exact location of it from the outside. Sliding that piece of flashing, so number two there, um, sliding it under the shingle. We then dip the lag bolt, which the lag bolt goes directly into your roof rafter, not just into the uh, sheathing. We dip that in a uh, roofing material. And then on the back side of the flashing, we create this U with uh, silicone uh, caulking. And that's an additional step that, that not everyone completes because it, it requires a little bit more material, but it's something that will really help prevent uh, 
uh, gets leaking uh, over a 25 year period because that's that's the least amount of time that these panels are going to be up here. So we do everything possible uh, from a quality standpoint to make sure that we don't have any issues. So finally, you have your, your finished product there. And then the last picture I always like to include in case anyone's ever curious about what it looks like under the solar panels. That's really what it looks like. So you'll never see that, maybe for a day. Uh, but once the panels go up, you won't see that portion of the install. The next couple slides are examples of projects that we've installed uh, nearby. Uh, one is in Carlisle, so for those of you that, that are familiar with Ask This Old House, uh, we worked with uh, that film crew to install this system and they actually filmed us doing it. So for those that, once again, that watch that show, um, they don't have bad uh, companies on that show. <laughs> so. That just goes to show, you know, Solar Flare, we're, we're here, we're a local company, uh, we do very high quality work. This next slide is of a, a standing seam metal roof. So we can install on standing seam metal roofs and there is no additional charge. So if you do have one of these types of roofs, then uh, we can install on that, no problem. We always get asked, are you going to cut a hole in that metal roof? Absolutely not. Um, that, that is, that's not, not what you should be doing on, on a roof like that. This one is here in Bolton. Uh, this belongs to one of our, uh, our customers here in Bolton. There's, this is about a 10 kilowatt system. There is some other panels on that other roof to the right. You can't really see because of the angle. Uh, but keep an eye out uh, because we're, we're probably going to have an open house uh, at this, this site. So you'll be able to see firsthand uh, the workmanship of Solar Flare, as well as talk to the homeowner about their experience with Solar Flare. Uh, and their system has been on for one year. Uh, so they can attest to our conservative uh, production estimates as well. Another example of a ground mounted installation in Charlton. And then this is one we completed recently in New Bedford for National Lumber. This is just one of their buildings. So we completed this on multiple uh, buildings of this size. So just go to show, you know, we can complete uh, large ground mounted systems as well as very large uh, commercial roof mounted systems. The next two slides, I'm gonna talk about the components that we're offering as part of the Solarized Bolton program. To start our base model system, comes with a Canadian solar 270 watt panel. So you would get that, that kind of standard uh, you know, blue, kind of dark blue cell, a silver frame panel. They, that does come in black uh, for a small charge. The next step up is our Cineva brand. Uh, that's our made in the US brand. Um, the company is out of Georgia and they manufacture their panels in Washington state as well as Michigan. So if you are looking for a, a US made uh, panel, we can <laughs> offer that. That comes uh, also in the standard looking blue and black. Lastly, you have the sun power panels. Uh, the sun power panels are very high output panels. <coughs> They're known for their high efficiency and high output. So these panels, uh, compared to the Canadian solar, these panels have a 320 watt output. So you're, you're talking about quite a jump there. Um, the medium, the Cineva panels, which is kind of the mid-road mid uh, panel, uh, is a 285 watt panel. So in addition to your US made panel, you're also getting a higher output panel. And then the final step up, which is really the, the uh, Cadillac of solar panels, is the SunPower brand. So we just talked about the first major component being the modules. The second major component is the uh, inverters. And as Tony and, and Chris talked about, we also offer the optimizers. The Enphase microinverters go on the back of each panel and they work independently of the panel left, right, above, or below. So as Tony discussed, uh, a central inverter setup, the panels are wired uh, in series. So when one of those panels is one of your say uh, six uh, is covered in snow, 
the other five will only produce as much as that uh, least producing panel. So you're, by going with just a central inverter and no uh, additional uh, panel level monitoring or production, uh, you're losing production. So you're creating this Christmas tree light effect almost as the best thing to compare it to. Um, but keep in mind with a central inverter setup only, you're, you're limited to the least producing panel. With Solar Edge, uh, the Solar Edge optimizers go on the back of each panel. So that is what uh, Chris has on his system. The central inverter is still there. It still exists, as Chris showed you in the pictures. That has a 12-year warranty. And then the Solar Edge optimizers have a 25-year warranty. Um, once again, we will discuss, depending on your site, what is what is recommended for your site, whether it be the microinverters or the solar edge optimizers. Other than production, there's some other things to keep in mind uh, when choosing one or the other. With the microinverters, they have a 25-year warranty. So I'll talk about warranties on the next slide, but the panel warranty is also a performance warranty of 25 years. So going with microinverters, you have a full system warranty for 25 years. Solar Edge, you will have to replace, typically replace that central inverter within, say, the, the 12 to 15 uh, year mark. Um, so a little bit lower upfront cost, um, but you are having to worry about that uh, inverter replacement. So it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And these are all questions we're going to ask you when we're out at your home to, to really understand what your goals are as a homeowner and, and what you're trying to achieve uh, down the road. Now lastly, I put the SunPower brand up there because SunPower is now offering what they call an AC module, which means that they have a factory, they have now factored, uh, integrated from the factory uh, a microinverter. So this, this is really a, a value question and it depends on what your situation is. Um, but you only need these panels uh, with this microinverter. You don't have to put an additional uh, central inverter. So you're removing that cost out of the system. Um, this is really a, a good deal um, compared to our, our prices that we offered for SunPower in the past because they've, they've really incorporated everything. And the great thing about SunPower is that you have a 25 year uh, warranty with SunPower on the panels and the microinverter that's attached to the back. In addition to that, uh, the warranty for SunPower is that they will cover even labor costs uh, up to 25 years. So, for example, as it says here, uh, Solar Flare's workman workmanship warranty is 10 years. If a panel goes bad in, in year 15, uh, without sun power, you'd have to just pay for the labor, which isn't going to be a whole lot. Um, but with sun power panels, sun power will actually pay us to come out even at year 15 and replace the panel. So everything is covered if you go with that sun power module. All the modules we're offering come with a 25 year performance warranty. The inverter warranty ranges between 10 and 25 years. So with the microinverters, you're getting that, uh, that, that 25 year warranty. As mentioned, the central inverter lifespan is between 10 and 15 years. So uh, the system is going to be up there for at least 25, uh, or at least we want you to leave it up there for at least 25. So keep that in mind. The replacement cost, and, and this is today, so it's hard to say down the road, but the replacement cost for a central inverter, just a single one, is about 1500 um, So it ranges. If you have a couple of them, if you have a larger system, you're going to need you know, two of those central inverters um, if you decide to go that route, in which case you'd be on the higher end of that range. Our workmanship warranty is 10 years. So once again, if anything happens, uh, you contact Solar Flare. And typically, we are able to dispatch someone the same day. Expected system life, 25 plus years. Um, just because the 25 year mark hits doesn't mean they just turn off at year 25. They will keep producing. However, the silicone within the, the panel has degraded um, down to, say, 80 or 85 percent. And then it, it increases its rate of degradation beyond the, the 25 year mark. So it starts to degrade much faster after 25 years. And lastly, really no maintenance. Now, 
Chris said he checks his, his you know, temperature and things like that. You can do that, uh, it's not required, um, because at Solar Flare, we are going to monitor your system on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. So typically, you're going to receive a call from us, unless you're watching your system uh, you know, every five hours, uh, you would receive a call from us before you know there's an actual problem with your system. So we would call you, go through some over the phone uh, diagnosis, um, maybe we can solve the problem over the phone, if not, we will definitely dispatch someone. We're, we're not going to make you uh, pull our arm to, to get someone out there. The next two slides I'm going to talk about the incentives that are available. It's important to keep in mind that these incentives are only available to homeowners that choose the direct purchase option. Um, that is what the majority of our uh, homeowners, our, our clients choose. Um, historically speaking, 98% uh, of our customers uh, have gone with direct ownership. Um, so I think that um, you know, it says a lot because we present both options side by side and typically when you see that side by side, you're gonna pick the direct ownership. The tax credits, number one, you have a 30% federal tax credit. So that is, keep in mind that's a tax credit, not a deduction. So it's a, a good dollar for dollar value as long as you have the tax liability there to use it. 15% up to 1,000 as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, would be credited to you by the state. So that works similar to the federal tax credit. It is a tax credit, not a deduction. You have your SREC revenue, which is something we will help you with. We let you know how to report it. Uh, we also set you up with a third party aggregator called SREC Trade. That's who we use on all of our residential and commercial systems. So they will sell the SRECs for you and then you'll receive a check direct deposited into your account of your choosing every quarter. And then lastly, you have your net metering. So your, that offsetting of your electric bill. That, that's, what it, that's what net metering is. To dive a little bit deeper into SRECs, the state recognizes that there's two byproducts of solar uh, PV, solar photovoltaics. Number one is the electricity you're producing on site to offset your electric bill. The other is the uh, clean value, the, you know, the positive environmental uh, aspect of, of owning and producing solar power. That is called an SREC. So no matter what you produce and use on your own bill, you're always producing SREC revenue. One SREC is worth 1,000 kilowatt hours of solar production. To put that in pers into perspective, a 20 panel system on your home will generate uh, on a, say an average site about 6,000 kilowatt hours annually. So now that we know 1,000 equals uh, one, then you're producing six SRECs annually uh, with that average size system. And that equates to about $1,400 annually in SREC revenue. And that's not even including your utility uh, offset, um, which would be around $1,000 to $1,100. So you have that savings. And then you're receiving this $1,400 uh, check uh, on an annual basis for 10 years. So these certificates can be bought and sold on the market. Uh, the first year is the floor price is $285. And then it slowly declines over time. So the, the last year's will be $189. So it does decline over time, um, but the revenue stream is there for 10 years. The reason why this SREC market works is because the utilities here in Massachusetts are required to make up a certain percentage of their energy portfolio with renewable uh, sources. The way that they do that, because they don't own solar farms and wind turbines, is they buy these SRECs. That percentage that they're required to buy increases every year because uh, more solar is getting installed. So that's how uh, the SREC market deals with supply and demand. Once again, SREC revenue will continue uh, for 10 years or 40 quarters. You do receive a check uh, on a quarterly basis, uh, not annually. It does take a little bit of time up front, 
the state takes some, uh, some time to register the system. So you will have to wait a little bit longer than, than one quarter to receive that first check. But after you get that first one, they will start coming on a regular basis. This is our tiered pricing structure that we're offering as part of the Solarized Bolton program. We are at tier one, uh, but we have completed, uh, after the one completed at five o'clock today, we've completed 20 visits already, excuse me, in Bolton, uh, since we were given the uh, list of interested homeowners last week. So we are moving very quickly to get uh, site visits completed um, and to get, get people signed up quickly. So uh, we feel that we'll get past this first tier very, very fast. And it's important to also note that the first 10 people that sign a contract with Solar Flare, in addition to the savings you're going to get when we, we reach Tier 5, you'll also get $500 off your deposit. So that's an incentive for the first 10 signed contracts in Bolton. Starting at Tier 1 and going to Tier 5, the difference is $0.47 cents on the lot. Now, what does, that, what does that really mean to you? On that average size system, so going back to that five kilowatt system, you're looking at a savings of about $2,400 from tier one to five. So quite a bit of savings there. Uh, but I also want to point out the fact that our tier five price is 308 a watt. Elizabeth, if you remember, mentioned that they're seeing in the state between four and five dollars per watt as an average. So to be at 308 a watt, um, is very, very competitive. Um, even with the Solar Edge adder, so there are adders that could raise that, uh, that per watt cost. This 308 is for a base model system. So even with the Solar Edge adder, so if you were, if you were seeing Chris's presentation and, and you said, hey, I'm, I want to have access to those graphs and that, that information is really interesting to me. Um, even with, with that adder in there, you're still looking at 321 a watt which is just slightly over $17,000 before any uh, tax credits are applied. So that's before a 30% tax credit, before a $1,000 state tax credit. So typically what we're seeing, once we reach this tier five, is that you're gonna have a return of, uh, say anywhere from four to five years on a system that is warranty for much longer than that. So that's why these solarized programs offer such a, a great opportunity to go solar. If you've been thinking about it, now is the time to do it. Um, because I will tell you now that these prices are not offered if you come to us um, off the street. So uh, this is a limited time offer. It's only available until the end of October. As an additional incentive uh, in the program, we are offering uh, a five kilowatt system donated to a local nonprofit or family. We need about 70 uh, homes to sign up in Bolton in order to reach this goal. Uh, we have set a goal for ourselves of, of 80 signed contracts, so we feel that we will reach that goal. Um, but that's, that's really up to uh, you as a community and how well you, you spread the word and, and how well uh, you know, the SolarEyes team uh, gets the word out there. So far, uh, they've been doing a great job. Um, when we're talking about the tier pricing, the final tier price is what everyone pays. Mm -hmm. Even if you sign up the very first sign up, you will get a rebate and a refund as the tier prices go up. So don't worry about being the first person signing up. You're going to pay the final rate, whatever it is that we reach. So you don't lose anything by signing up first. In fact, you get a little bit more back. Yeah, so to expand off of Chris's uh, comment, we will, if you have paid in full by the time we reach that tier five goal, we will issue a check uh, to you for the difference. So everyone benefits. For financing options, we're offering the Mass Solar Loan Program. Um, we've seen interest rates as low as 1.25% on those, um, but the rates won't be any higher than three and a quarter. Um, so it is a state funded uh, loan program, as Elizabeth mentioned. There are multiple lenders um, that, that are working with this program, and we can provide you uh, with that list. We're also offering uh, SunGage Financing, which offers uh, five to 10 year loan terms, a little bit higher interest rate um, than the Massachusetts Solar Loan Program. However, the benefit um, to going with SunGage is they actually offer a monthly fixed option for your SRECs. So regardless of what your system's producing, they base that 
SREC payment off of your system size, and they'll issue the same check to you every single month uh, for 10 years, which is really great for families that want to know exactly um, what type of income they're, they're, they have coming in. Um, whereas the, you know, the SREC revenue is more based on, it's based on production. Um, so this is a good option uh, for those folks that want that, that solid uh, uh, payment every month. Also as part of this program, we are offering the Power Purchase Agreement, uh, which is a third party owned system. Um, so you would not see the tax benefits or the SREC uh, benefits if you went this route. Um, but as Elizabeth mentioned, it is good for folks that don't have the, the tax liability there. The way that this works is you can, you can give either a, you know, anywhere from a zero to a $2,000 uh, down payment with an escalator of zero uh, to 2.9%. That escalator has to do with your rate, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, that escalator will signify whether or not the rate uh, that you sign on with goes up every year or not. Um, the third party that we use is Sunrun, a very reputable company. I'm sure a lot of you may have seen their, uh, their commercials. The way that it works is you, as a homeowner, someone is, uh, is paying for the system on your roof, but you're experiencing the benefit through a lower cost per kilowatt hour. So that cost per kilowatt hour ranges from 10 and a half to 14 cents. Um, right now you're paying somewhere uh, around say 18 to 20 cents. Um, so you are getting a decreased rate. And that is locked in for 20 years. So if you uh, choose a 0% escalator and put 2,000 down, you're probably going to get that closer to that 10 and a half cents. And that's locked in for 20 years. Um, but remember, you're missing out on a lot of the benefits as far as SREC revenue um, and utility savings. Because a power purchase agreement will never give you a $0 bill. You're always going to be paying uh, something to Sunrun. Like I said, it's a 20-year agree agreement. It is easily transferable. So if you do sell the home, Sunrun actually has uh, their own department that just handles the transfers. Um, so that will, that will go smoothly if that's something you need to, to work out. This option does typically require good site conditions and a credit score, good credit score, because they want to make sure the system they're, they're purchasing uh, for your home is going to produce at an optimal level. Now, the, the benefit here for those that choose uh, this option is that once we reach Tier 5, you'll receive that amount of money in a cumulative amount. So if you sign up at Tier 1 with the Power Purchase Agreement and you put 2000 down, once we reach Tier 5, you would receive a check from SolarFlare for $2,750. So that is the benefit that a PPA purchaser gets from participating in the Solarized Bolt uh, program. Now, before I start, um, Chris, Chris is going to be fielding any questions uh, after I get done with this slide, but I want to go through these basic questions first. Um, number one, what if my roof is old? Uh, typically, if you have, say, anywhere from five to eight years left on your roof, we suggest that you do get that, uh, that redone, your roof redone prior to us installing solar. We can come back uh, and remove the panels and put them back up, but the price is gonna range between $1,500 and, and $2,000, depending on the size of the system. So obviously a 20 panel system would be less than a 40 panel system to remove. Do I need to clean the panels or remove snow from them? The answer is no. Um, some people do. If you do, we always recommend you use uh, a rubber uh, roof rake or uh, wrap a, a metal one with a towel. Um, but generally, Mother Nature is going to clean those panels for you. So once the sun comes out, those panels are going to start to heat up and then the snow is going to slide off. Um, but as Tony uh, has, has shown us, if you only do the bottom row of panels with the roof rake, generally that snow is, is going to uh, slide right down. So that'll, that will speed up the process a little bit. Will the solar panels be able to withstand harsh environmental conditions? The answer is yes. We do engineer our systems um, 
to, to code, of course. Um, so they're, they're able to hand, handle uh, you know, the 10 feet of snow, uh, 55 pounds per, uh, per square foot is what we designed them to. It really depends on the town that ranges. Up in West Newbury, it's, it's higher um, because they get a little bit more. Um, but they're also engineered to withstand a three second burst of 100 mile an hour winds. So you don't have to worry about the panels getting, getting ripped off the roof. That's not going to happen. How much weight do the panels add? They add about three to four pounds per square foot. So not a ton of weight, but depending on the age of your home, that could tip the scales a little bit. So we'll have to discuss that with you, uh, you know, after we take a look at your uh, attic space and see what size rafters you have. And who do I contact if something goes wrong? As I've said in previous slides, you contact Solar Flare. You don't have to contact the manufacturer. You contact us and we will deal with them directly. Typically, especially if there is an issue, say with the microinverter, um, we have those in stock. So we'll just give you one we have in stock and then we'll deal with the manufacturer on the back end to get a replacement uh, for our stock. That way you're not waiting um, you know, to go through that process in order to get your, your system back up and running. So that's, that's all I have uh, as part of my presentation. The next step is if you haven't already, contact us uh, for a free site assessment. You can do that either through our website uh, by clicking, once you get there, Solarize Mass, it's a nice big logo. Or you can go to the solarizebolton.org uh, website. That's one that Chris uh, and Tony and the others put together. You can email us at residentialsales at solarflare.com. Or I put Tom's number up there. <laughs> you can call him if you'd like. But if you need to reach Tom directly, that is his number. Uh, step two, review our proposal. Hopefully you sign up quickly and get your installation uh, within, say, four to five months. Uh, it's, it's typical install time. And then you start saving. So thank you all for coming out. I'm going to give it over to Chris, and he's going to field any questions that you have uh, about the, the three presentations that we've we've done this evening. Sure. So thank you. Okay, we've got a couple of um, questions that were asked before this, and we're going to go through the answers on those, which cover a couple of things that people generally wanted to know. And after that, we'll field questions from the audience. So the first the first question here was, what about mold, mildew, and fungus under the panels? Uh, there's two answers to this. It's not typical for the installations to harbor any of the moisture that would normally cause that to occur. And the second answer is you're mounting the panels on the warm side of the house, the side the sun shines on. Although your roof is no longer going to be baked by the sun, it does get quite warm under the panels and any moisture that's under there is going to evaporate very, very quickly. It doesn't have the ability to even start the, the growth cycle. Let me just add too that, that uh the sun sets up a convection of, of air current going up underneath the panels between the panel and roof, so that tends to dry things out. Okay, uh, depth of snow, you covered that one. In, uh, it's 10 feet of snow, roughly 55 pounds per square foot. Uh, what happens during unusual events? Okay, power outages. We are using what's called a grid-tied system. It needs the grid to operate. The grid tells the solar system what kind of power to produce, what frequency, what voltage. When the grid goes down by law, the system has to shut off. And that's to both protect the home, because otherwise you'd be trying to power all your neighbors, and the line workers that are out there trying to fix the power outage. Um, there are battery backup systems that you can install, but at this moment in time, they're really not cost effective unless you have a very specific need. Talk to Dan's crew. Um, generally speaking, it's still cheaper to have a generator if you want to have backup power in a power outage. Um, but that, that's just the way the, the economics work right now. Supposedly, Mr. Musk is trying to change that. We'll see if they succeed. Uh, power failures, can I cut over to a generator but not start it? Basically, your generator would work the same way in a power failure as it works today. The solar panels really have no effect on that. If you're running on generator, you're going to run on generator solely. The, so the solar will not kick in. Otherwise, you'd have a feedback in your generator, and it wouldn't be able to handle it. The grid's a much larger sponge. The amount of power you're putting out into the grid, it doesn't even know it's there for the most part. So that's the difference between your little generator and the, the grid. Uh, power failures, and I start the generator. We talked about that. 
Can they provide sample schematics? This is one of the cool things with Solar Flare. They will actually give you the schematics for your system so you know exactly how it's hooked up. So if you're concerned about the way the power is going to be put through your panel, this will alleviate that problem. You'll see exactly how they plan on linking your solar to your house. What indicators are provided to the occupants? Generally speaking, if a problem is found, the installer gets notification by the monitoring system and they will act on it. They actually get a lot more notifications than you'll ever see. It trips on all kinds of little things, sometimes as much as a, you know, a bad cloud going over. Um, the fact of the matter is, is you don't have to do a thing. Or you can bring up the monitoring system and see how your panels are going, doing. I, I showed a couple examples in my presentation. But you get that for the lifetime of the system, whether you go with um, power uh, excuse me, microinverters or you go with the power optimizers. Both of those companies offer up to panel level monitoring so you can see exactly what your system's doing. Um, our installer selection process. Um, let's go to the next chart there, Tony, so we can see that. Yeah, I'll do it. All right. So we, uh, we try to simplify the installer selection process. It still looks complicated, and it really was. We, uh, as Sharon mentioned, we, we submitted our proposal around the end of January, and uh, we could foresee that, that the, the tall pole in the tent was going to be the RFP process. So we began working on it even before we were awarded the, uh, the contract by, by uh, CEC uh, with the cooperation of uh, CEC and uh, Elizabeth helped us out on that. We, even before that, around January, Chris put together some early RFP inputs. Then we got the, the template RFP. And we worked, <clears throat> we got inputs uh, also from Bob Bush, who worked with me at Raytheon for many years. And we did a mapping of these early inputs to the template. And then we began seriously working on the actual construction of the, of the RFP. We, uh, we had solar coach training, and, and the very day of the solar coach training, we were going over our draft RFP with Elizabeth after the meeting. And, uh, we released the RFP around the end of uh, April. We had a, uh, a bidder's teleconference, and we had qu early questions to that, which we answered. Oh, by the also, we had some uh, political things going on. We participated in the lobby day at the State House, and that, that helped to get the uh, emergency SREC bill passed in the uh, H4173 which are, are needed to continue the, the process. The proposals were due here, and then the first thing we had a threshold review by Cadmus, and it, we got seven proposals, and after the threshold review, it, the number went down to five, and then uh, we went down to three who were invited to install our interviews, and from there we're down to two and finally one. So it was really, uh, really quite an involved process. And, and uh, some of the details, if you're interested in the criteria, the requirements, they're available still on our website. And the technical requirements were established by CEC, but we added six more based on Chris and my, our experience uh, with solar PV. We added other requirements and identified them as Bolton, and the, the bidders appreciated that we did that because they, they were able to use uh, parts of their proposals from uh, other programs. A couple of them forgot to change the name in a few places, <laughs> a little embarrassing, but uh, they weren't among the winners. Uh, the evaluation team included three of us, Chris and I were on it, and, and uh, Margaret. And this, I, th this, I think this is a direct quote from Bob Bush, and, and he and I have worked on this for many years in, in industry. And this is every bit as challenging as, as an industry procurement process. Everything we went through here was really, really quite an involved uh, process. One of the big things that we wanted is we wanted enough um, options for people so that we covered all the possibilities and that's really why solar flare shined in the end is that they really gave us the wide breadth of options so we can do roof mount we can do ground mount we can do string inverters we can do optimizers we can do uh, micro inverters and we can increase the panels as well so um, it was just that that made it uh, the ideal 
early, early energy payback time. This is a, the question is, how long does it take for a typical solar PV panel to recover the carbon credits that were expended in its manufacture? And the answer is about a year, based on this, this reference here, which is generally highly regarded. You can see the projection here goes down to about a year. Uh, and it, it is decreasing. It's getting better and better as manufacturing processes are, are improving. So uh, what this means is that after a year, your solar panels have recovered all the energy that it took to manufacture them, all, all of the carbon credits. And from then on, it's, it's benefiting the environment. All right. Is that our first question over here? I'm just curious if the SRECs are a taxable income. As far as I can tell, no. Um, it's not considered income. And when I tried to actually record it as income my very first year, uh, TurboTax rejected it. <laughs> so I've been running it without it. I haven't been audited yet. And as far as I know, that's the way it's supposed to work. Generally, the advice I've heard is that if it doesn't have a 1099, then it's not taxable. Okay, first question over there. Yeah, I'm Jan Johnson. I'm, I believe that the most appropriate spot on my property is on wetland. Do you have any experience with that in Bolton with regulations? Can we take that one? Yeah. We'll definitely have to look into your situation more specifically, um, but we, we will definitely work with you to, to try to make it happen. Um, it just it requires a little uh, you know, extra steps um, in order to, to make that happen. Um, but that, those extra steps uh, would be included. And we're not going to charge you extra for that. All right, thank you. My question is about the Mass Solar Loan Program. Uh, is the interest on that loan deductible as a home improvement or not? Uh, that is a great question. Um, you know, I can't say I actually know the answer to that. Maybe I, we could uh, talk afterwards. I can grab your contact information and I can get back in touch with you. Okay, thank you. All right. Be sure you get Elizabeth's contact information so we can get an answer to that one for yeah. you. And, and to add to that, it, it typically, um, if it's a secured loan um, to, you know, to kind of tie to your mortgage, then you can, kind of like a home equity uh, line. Um, but I'm not sure that, that all of these lenders provide that option. That, that's usually the requirement, is it has to have your home as the equity to the loan. Yep. A lot of the loans are not, uh, have no equity, so they, they, they can't be. Yeah, who maintains the grid after National Grid goes bankrupt? <laughs> <laughs> all right, there is a huge fact on our website that talks about this. The fact of the matter is, is that for every dollar that's spent in, in Massachusetts, over $2 comes back in, in terms of, um, of benefit from our solar. Um, the Massachusetts legislature in 2015 had a study done to see exactly what that return was. And th there was a range given between uh, $2.10 to $2.40 or something to that effect. And for every dollar that you're spending on your, your um, electricity today, the green energy return is over $2. So it's, it's, it's a two to one. So who's going to maintain the grid? The actual savings by the utility is what's going to maintain that grid. By us pumping power out at what we pay for our rate is saving the utility a tremendous amount of money during their peak hours. A peak hour utility rate, what they're paying on the wholesale market, can be over a dollar a kilowatt at times. You're still, you're still pumping out energy to them free of charge at the 18 cents a kilowatt that you, get, you pay. So they're making a little bit of money by not having to bring in those extra expensive reserves. That's the part of the equation that's very rarely explained when they try to tell you that the grid doesn't get covered. They're saving money. This is saving the utility money too. They don't have to have energy piped in from Canada to cover those expensive, hot summer days. So that, that's the answer to that question. Hi. Regarding the net metering, uh, did you imply by your uh, credit statement on your uh, bill that you can never actually get a check from the power company? No, you can never convert that credit to cash. Okay. What you can do is donate the credit to any other entity on our load zone. 
our load zone currently goes to the New York border. So okay. any nonprofit in that load zone would be a tax deduction. Or if you want to help out Aunt Margaret, put it on her bill. That's the ability of this. Net metering means whatever you pay out, you have that value that you can distribute to anyone else in that load zone. Okay, so I could uh, have a neighbor who is not in a suitable location. I could sell the credit to him for 80% or whatever the face value. That would be a contract between you and him. But as far as the utility is concerned, yes, you can give that credit to another person in your load zone. Okay, thank let, you. Let me just add to that. I, I looked into this a couple of years ago, and National Grid at that time told me that there, there is a way to get the money back. You have to do a special request, and there are a lot of forms involved, but it is, it is possible, I was told then. Um, this is Elizabeth Youngblood. My understanding is, though, that the utilities would pay at the wholesale rate versus the retail rate. That's so you'd correct. be yeah. getting yeah. maybe yeah. The, the, sure, the, sorry, I'm trying to speak to the microphone, but also speak to you. You'll get some, if you were to have that happen, you would get it at, the, you would be provided the, the money at the wholesale rate. So if you had a certain amount of credits, you'd be getting four cents a kilowatt hour versus retail rate is closer to 18 cents. Does that make sense? The cash out would be a wholesale rate cash out, not the retail rate. Yeah. And, it, and it's, a, it's a lot of forms, and you'd have to do it every single month. So. so you emphasize roof mount systems. What about ground mount systems, and how much more do they cost? I forget what the adder is. It's, it's about a dollar, I think, per kilowatt for the ground mount. Um, the, the issue with the ground mount is that you're generally going to aim it directly south, so your system is automatically going to be more effective than a marginal roof mount. Overall, the cost per watt goes up, but the amount of wattage that you need to install goes down. So you'll have to talk to Dan's crew at the time, to, because every home is going to be aimed slightly different, and you're going to be able to see, you know, is my ground mount going to be significantly more expensive, or will I actually be saving money? But, Right. Shade trees, uh, historical homes, things along that nature, stone walls sometimes get in the way. Those are all good reasons to go ground mount, and we do have quite a few of them in town where people have done that to try to get A, better production, and B, save a lot of those things. There's no reason to get rid of that, that family uh, shade tree that you love so much. You can put the solar on an unused part of your land and get the same benefits. About the YesRec program, um, the number was thrown out that said year one, $285 per SREC, uh, year 10, $189 per SREC. Um, how firm are those numbers? Are there any risk to the SREC program that we need to know about? So once uh, you, as a customer, are participating in the SREC program, you're in the SREC program for 10 years. So that, that's not going to be an issue where, let's say, year five, year, you know, the SREC program just ends. You, once you're, you get your 40 quarters. Um, the, the note about the kind of floor price of 285, um, it is a market-based mechanism. Um, so it, you know, you could potentially, there could be more demand than supply in a given year, and then you would get more for the SREC. There may be times where there's more supply than demand, and the spot market um, is going to be less than that 285. Uh, the mention here was of a floor price. That's, that's uh, there's an auction mechanism that happens uh, basically six months after the calendar year. The utilities are highly incentivized to purchase any excess extracts at that um, kind of, as it's, I guess it's kind of a soft floor price. It's not a, it's not a hard floor price. Um, there are consequences if the utilities don't purchase them, um, but they can opt to do so if they want to. Um, if that were the case, then you would be given an SREC back into your account to be sold at a later time. Unlike a stock where it can go up and down and actually disappear altogether, your SRECs are guaranteed to have that, that minimum soft floor. And, and, and she said, the utilities are given a lot of incentives to buy up the SRECs to the point where, at the, I think it's the third level of the auction, they're actually worth three to four times what they would be normally to the utility. So they're buying at a very low price and they're getting a lot out of it. That floor keeps a value on that SREC, even if there was an oversupply for whatever reason. That's what he was talking about with that decreasing number. The actual sale price is based on the market. 
If we have, for example, a really tough winner, your winner SRECs are going to be very valuable because there aren't going to be that many out there. Uh, on the other hand, a very bright, sunny, not very rainy summer, you're going to have an overabundance of SRECs and the price will start dropping a little. And if you watch the prices, they do bounce around. Typically and historically, these kind of programs, once they close, tend to increase in value because the SREC programs that occur in the past are generally valued higher than the ones that occur currently and the ones that come separately. Tony is on the SREC 1 program, which uh, ended about two years ago. I'm on the SREC 2 program. Tony's SRECs paid him over $500 last quarter. Mine paid me about $300. So historically, and I'm not guaranteeing this, but historically, when an SREC program or a program of that type closes, the value of those particular uh, commodities does tend to increase over time. So like a stock, there's no guarantees, but there are trends that you can look at in that regard. So when does SREC 2 end? There's a good question, and unfortunately there's no solid answer for that. Right now it's guaranteed through the end of the year or when they come up with a new program. The contract says that Solar Flare has up to 12 months to install after a building permit is issued. You know, if this goes, you know, out past the end of the year, or is the SREC program going to be there? If you sign up now rather than waiting till October 31st, uh, So it's absolutely. based upon sign up or building permit date or signing up locks us into the SREC 2 program? No. That gets locked in when you get the uh, permission to turn the system on. So that's after install? That is after install. So if the install takes 12 months, the SREC program might not be there? It's, it's unlikely, but yes, that is correct. Okay. That's why you really kind of want to be on the front end of this. Yep. And, and just to add, our install timeline right now is four to five months. Okay. And All right. I was just looking at the contract. I just wanted to. Yeah. No. That. I, I, that is. You know, hearing, hearing you say that in public is 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 good. Yeah. Thank you. No. It is. It is part of the Solarize program. The installer does have 12 months to install the uh, system, but by no means do we want to hit that 12 months. If if it does reach that point, it's typically because a homeowner has uh, put off the installation due to financial reasons or uh, other reasons, you know, getting a, a roof done or adding a, an addition. Uh, but right now, our install timeline is four to five months. Um, we're working on getting that even lower. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions this evening? Okay. If you do have further questions, you can either use the website, the uh, Solarize Bolton at Gmail, contact Dan's crew directly through their website and their email, call us. The numbers that uh, Solar Flare are giving out are their personal cell phone numbers. I was amazed, but it is the truth. You will talk to the person that you're calling, and they will, you know, it's, it's what they're carrying on their hip. Um, very unique, because I, no other company has been doing that. So please, if you have any question, if you contact the Solarize Bolton Committee, it'll be Tony or I that will answer your question, or perhaps we'll, you'll get both of our opinions, because... Yeah. <laughs> we each we have, don't always agree. No, we don't. And actually, this worked out really well. Um, so please, any question at all. There's no such thing as a dumb one, as Sharon will attest. She's asked quite a few uh, throughout this whole process because she's learning how all this works. I spent you know, 16 different installers and over a year researching this. It's not easy, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense half the time. So please, ask the questions. On behalf of uh, Elizabeth... Dan, Tony, and myself, I thank you all for coming this evening. And I hope, please, talk to your friends and neighbors. Just present them with the opportunity to have the evaluation. Let them see the numbers for themselves, what they can be saving when they have solar installed. It's an opportunity to have a huge impact on your house that pays itself back. And we're talking 308 per watt installation. Your home's value will go up on average of $3.40 per watt by having that on the roof. And by the way, that value added to your house cannot be taxed in Massachusetts for 20 years. What other addition can you put on your home that isn't taxed? And there's no sales tax on the equipment either. 
Thank, Thank you all, you all for, coming. for coming.